HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca. Ithaca, New York boasts an authentic craft beverage experience, tasty farm-to-table culinary adventures, and scenic outdoor recreation among 150 waterfalls. Plan your trip today with help from visitithaca.com. This is Jimmy Carboni, the host of Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. I've been a part of the HRN community for 10 years. After all that time, I'm constantly inspired by the incredible voices of our network. Each week, I record my show in the HRN studio because I'm excited to bring you, our listeners, the most important stories from the world of beer, food, cider, and more. All of us here at HRN make food radio because we love it. This year, HRN is celebrating its 10th anniversary, but we need your support to keep food radio going strong for the next decade. Join the HRN community today by becoming a member. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate right now. You can even show some love from my show by selecting Beer Sessions in the designation drop-down menu. Thanks for listening to HRN. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, it's June 18th, 2019. We have a special show here. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host of Beer Sessions Radio. Uh, a few months ago, um, my good buddies, the beer table you know, panel experts, Gavin and Megan and Justin and Noah, uh, went into the basement at Jimmy's Number 43, which is my pub, which has been closed for a couple of years. And uh, we knew that there was a, st- a stash of some pretty interesting beers, probably some Belgians that had been there for a couple of years, and um, they were really interested in getting them. So this whole show is about them, their ever, you know, unquenchable thirst for beer knowledge and for, for e- explaining to you guys more about the world of beer. And I'm really proud to have them here, and this is kind of their show. So guys, let's introduce, everyone introduce themselves, and, and just kind of in your own words, I will say that I asked, uh, I asked uh, Gavin, I said, you know, what, what do you guys... What did you guys get? Because they made a point of going through all the beers, and they said, well, "We're not telling." There's some classics, some curveballs, and some mysteries. So, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I'm Gavin. I'm the buyer at Beer Table at Grand Central. Um, I was down in that murky basement digging out all these beers, and I'm really excited to pop some open. All right. Hey, I'm Noah. I also work at uh, Beer Table Grand Central, and uh, yeah, Gavin and I cleaned off a couple hundred dirty bottles of beer together. So. Definitely so it was that some. many. Like we posted on Instagram, there are a couple of photos, but you, you got a couple hundred bottles of beer. Yeah, we pulled stuff that we thought might be interesting or tasty. You know, obviously not all of it's going to be in perfect condition, but we'll find out tonight. Great. I'm Justin. I'm the founder of Beer Table. Justin, it's great to have you, man. Thank you. Thanks David. for bringing your crew. We've had some really great shows with you guys. And your new friend. I'm Evan Julius Rose. <laughs> Call him <laughs> Julius. <laughs> I'm a friend of Beer Tables. Uh, Megan, uh, I was not there for the procurement of these bottles, but I have heard many stories Trying to since build we you got up, them, Megan. so I'm like really <laughs> excited to check it all out. And you're also the GM, and you're the smartest person in the room. Oh, so. thanks, Jimmy. True. Hey, the whole, the whole show is about, you guys have a great a great team, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you guys. So, so um, why don't you guys give me the intro? So we, we went in this basement, you know, 
some people are into aging beers. I felt like, like 20 years ago, and maybe Justin, you're there with me. 20, 25 years ago, it seemed like the diehard beer bars were buying some, always buying some good barley wines and a few things like that with the intention of aging it. And they would actually have multiple vintages. But it seems like in these days, everyone's trying to buy cans and IPAs and move them. Um, I don't know. What, what's your take on all this, Justin? Yeah, so, I mean, my experience with old beer and cellaring beer and all that uh, came not only from working with uh, for Be United for a while and uh, Matthias's, uh, uh influence with that, but also uh, a, a weird experience I had with a dude who walked into the first beer table in Brooklyn and basically offered to sell me his whole cellar of things that he had uh, amassed over the years and decided he was not into English beer, but he had all these old barley wines and Thomas Hardy's and J.W. Lee's and beautiful things that we still have some of. Um, and that's where that's kind of where we got the beginning of our cellar. And uh, now we try to pillage others like yours. And over the winter, we were talking about this because I remember when I when I took over this base at Jimmy's number 43, it had been the basement for the, the old original uh, Burke Castle and Brewski bars, which right. were on 7th Street back to the 1980s. And one thing that was in the cellar at the time were like, all these amazing beers like old crustacean and barley wines and, and things that you never would have seen and yep. I literally put them on a list back in 2005 and I sold them within a month yeah. to, to, and people got really excited about it and you can't really go out and, and and build a vintage beer list I mean it's not is there anyone that's doing that is it something that people think about I mean it, go ahead I mean pretty much anytime you get something that's going to age well We'll peel off a few and set aside, um, you know, a quarter of a case here or half a case there. Um, so we're keeping that tradition kind of alive. Uh, there's a few res- restaurant groups that I know of that uh, have dedicated cellars uh, and a little more buying power than Little Old Beer Table. Um, Union Square Hospitality comes to mind that I know that they've got extensive uh, vintage beer collections. A lot of the, um, you know, Belgian lambics that uh, really develop over time and, uh, like, Old stock style beers like um, barley wines and stuff that uh, are meant to be, you know, for later. But generally, it's it's more like accidental, isn't it? I mean, I remember one year, you know, you'll, you'll get a call from an importer or, or a distributor and saying, oh, we actually happen to have th- this beer from this vintage or we might be getting in something. Uh, is, there, is there anyone, I mean, with Be United, is anybody like putting aside regular vintages uh, of certain beers? And is there a market for it, too? That's the other thing. I mean, I think it's a pretty limited market, but it, you know, it's definitely there, and I don't think it'll go away. And I think, you know, folks are much more open to understanding that beer doesn't have to just be young and fresh, but that there is a giant spectrum of what's out there. So, you know, for for certain, you know, Be United has has led the way on that, and I'm I'm sure that others have some some old stock of things. I'm I'm not sure exactly who, but so what what were you guys expecting when you, you know, we talked about Justin and you brought your crew. We went to the basement, Jimmy's number forty three. Um, stuff had been it's a basement but still it was you know it wasn't 100 percent perfect condition it had been closed for <laughs> almost two years is that how you meant to say that it seemed <laughs> as though it had been flooded and it was like <laughs> fully scary moldy it was i was i was surprised that the uh, the floorboard supported all four of us for as long <laughs> as they did um, no, I remember when you were in construction, when you were when you were building the place, seeing the stash of things that was there that predated Jimmy's, and I was hoping we would find some of that. You sold it all. That went fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, I put a beer list up when, when I first opened in 25, and I think I had 15 different really good vintage beers, and I sold them for $20 each, and they, they were gone in a month. And people started coming in, where's the vintage beer list? I'm like, that was the vintage beer list. So. <laughs> there it went. That's it. <laughs> that's, I think that's the other hard part, is it's not something that you can maintain. You know, so people come to you expecting, like, they have X, Y, Z, and every time I go, they're going to have X, Y, Z, and, you know, that's a tricky thing to explain or to maintain, I should say, uh, continuously well-aged. You could probably have vintage stuff all the time, but who's to say it's going to be good and well-curated? Yeah, and you have to, you'd have to have, knowing, maybe you're out in the country and you own a property, you'd have to kind of know that you... And you're, it's also the source of this stuff too, right? I mean, you don't want something that's changed hands four times. You don't you don't know where it's been been stored. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, if 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 you do this often, Justin, I mean, do you you, you buy some people's you know sellers? We Is haven't, it, but I want to. You want to. It's and, interesting, and you know, we're learning about it as we go. And you know, we still have a decent amount of stuff that I bought in two thousand eight when I opened the original beer table. Um, that you know, admittedly, it's moved with me as I've moved you know, four times since then, and that's not great for it. But, 
you know, it's fun occasionally to crack something open and see what's great and what's horrible. And, you know, there are lots of duds, but it's, it's just a fun experiment for us to constantly learn with. So let's go through. What's the first beer? Is it a beer or a cider? I know you love ciders, Jimmy. <laughs> Let me see. So, yeah, the first thing we've got is a packed basket from South Hill. Gavin, you know what year that was? Um, I can find out. Give me two seconds. You might have been 2015. But, yeah, South Hill's really cool up in the Hudson Valley. Um, uh, 2014. Upstate. Very close. And this is, uh, I think, all foraged apples and pears in this one. Um, but just be really cool to see where this ended up after. Well, if you want to know, my, I'll tell you my backstory on the beer since I yeah. bought most of it. I mean, around that time, the Cider Week's first Cider Week in New York was 2011. And I know at Jimmy's number 43, we were lucky enough to host a lot of the opening events for that. Got to know some of those. The cider makers in, in New York, and uh, Steve Silent is South Hill, and he's mostly a, a forager. They have these great national forests around the Finger Lakes where there's a lot of heirloom you know, apple trees. But I'm surprised that this, this I haven't really had any uh, aged ciders. And if this was a 2014 vintage, um, this is tasting really good. I think it tastes probably as That's good awesome. as it ever would have. Yeah. You know, and honestly, the cellar condition, the 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 cooling system wasn't on for a year and a half. Um, there but was it was nice and cool down there. Yeah, it the was. It's still a basement and it's insulated, um, so it's probably just like anyone else's basement in, in you know in New York. So. I'm pretty happy with it. Cheers. Good job, really Steve. Nice. Yeah. It's really nice to sit It is nice to see. Like, more when, acidic when you, than I would have thought. One yeah, thing about tasting, you know, acidic at all. tasting older wines or, or ciders is that it gives you a sense of just how good the cider maker was, and in this case, like, the ingredients, right? Yeah. Hey, just out of curiosity, how much beer was left behind? Oh, after, Very after we pillaged? No, I mean, <laughs> how much was there when you guys went in, and how much did you leave behind? I think we took a couple hundred bottles. And yeah, pro- I mean, when, when it closed in the summer 100. of 2017, yeah. so I anything that was, like, usable, we probably used at some tastings or festivals, you know, like if there are cases of something. Um, but mostly we were a draft-driven a draft di- driven restaurant. So the way I bought these products was, like, for Cider Week, I would buy certain, you know, a case each of certain really good ciders or for I do a, a Belgian event maybe twice a year so the same thing I would stock up one case each of, of certain certain bottles so it wasn't something that we were moving regularly so when we closed I took things that were in cases so if I had a case of something I took it but these were all just random bottles so there might have been one bottle of something it might have been three bottles of something um, so that's what was left behind so it wasn't like there were stocks of like kegs, cases of IPAs or anything so, but it tells more about what you guys saw. So you, you went in there, you thought it was, you didn't know what to expect. But what, were you, have you tasted any of the bottles yet? Uh, we've had two accidental tastes. Um, <laughs> while Noah and I were cleaning all of the, the mold and dust and uh, leftovers off of the bottles. Um, truly accidentally, uh, a bottle of uh, Stillwater, oh, I can't remember what it was. Something uh, Arcana. Um, uh, got like half dropped and uh, just enough to dislodge the cork a little bit and we heard the CO2 escaping so we you know had to bite the bullet and drink that one uh, and <laughs> took one it, for the team it, it survived it did really it you know uh, it tasted great it was really mellow uh, very little oxidation it was yeah, the carbonation was great had you guys tried that one when it originally came out no. no. I did, yeah. Um, I remember it being, like, the roastiness of the dark malts were uh, a little ashy and a little um, rough and bitter, and it had really rounded out. It was it was wonderful, and um, awesome. I snagged a photo of it and sent it to Brian Strumke, the brewer, and he was like, where in the hell did you find this thing? <laughs> he also dated it for us, right? Yeah, he helped us uh, track down the year it was made and where. What year was it made? Oh, God. Uh, Stillwater, it was Arcana. It. I remember it. it. Oh, Again, that, that, that's how we used to buy. That was the way we bought one case of that beer, and it would be on like our like general bottle list. And we didn't expect to move it. You know, it, it could have I could have lasted a whole year, and and that's how we bought. The, so if we bought any beer that any beer that was in the cellar, um, Evan Julius uh, was was I knew would be fine for one or two years. Um, so now we've had we've had some things that have been there for maybe four years. Um, and what else did you guys get? The, the next stuff. Um, well, so I thought, and Megan was asking if Gavin had had um, 
the Stillwater beer, you know, and it was fresh. I thought it'd be fun to then try this year's version or release of Pack Basket from South Hill. Um, you know, it's foraged apples, obviously be a little bit different, but it'd be fun to try like a fresh version of this. Um, compared Bring to it on, one. man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there's so much variation. We're actually doing a cider event tomorrow. If you're still listening, and you're in New York tomorrow, cider feast NYC in, in Williamsburg. <laughs> but um, the reason it's interesting is that guys like Steve Salen, but um, Andy Brennan of Aaron Burr, uh, it's his book release party. So if you're interested in learning about cider, get Uncultivated from Chelsea Green Publishing. Highly recommend it. Um, it's it's the first book that really talks about the whole culture. Of, of wild apples and, and, and cider, not as like a how to cider book, but just more about what, what it takes to, to be a cider person. And um, it's pretty interesting. Slightly controversial for some of the commercial cider makers, but I don't think so. I think you got to get overlook. If he, if he insults, you know, your methods, I think that he just cares about good cider. So, in the same way, we're seeing the fruits right here. This pack basket from 2014 five years later tastes amazing so let's taste the the newer is this a new vintage uh this is yeah i just got this from their like cider quarterly cider club um i think this is so what 2017 probably um 2018 but yeah and this one doesn't have any pear the uh, first one did but this yeah. one's I mean noticeably sweeter than the vintage oh yeah sweeter a lot more floral on the nose yeah, I mean, the other thing about these types of ciders is that they're really different, not just the, the fruit every year, it's also sometimes the blends are different. So it's hard to compare, you know, it's not like it's a set Bordeaux vintage that you know it's the same fields every year. Um, I don't know if you guys think about that stuff. What else do you think about when we're tasting, you know, and, and going through this? I mean, Justin, I know you've, uh, you, you, to me, you're one of my beer gods, so <laughs> what are you thinking? I think we're just enjoying it, Jimmy. Can't. <laughs> the uh, the older one, uh, it has a larger mouth feel than the newer one. I don't know what might cause that. If it's the pear, if it's a flavor thing. Um, it's aged. If it aged, it's softer, while still being tangy. It's nice. Absolutely, I had a good uh, acidic tang without getting into that you know vinegary acidic territory. Do you know, are they pitching yeast on this, or are they just using the yeast on the skin? It's all the natural. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Then it's going to have wild yeast, so it's all this, like, slow-acting Britannomyces and wild yeast. And that stuff, I mean, it doesn't really kick on for a while. And it can chew on some sugars and complex carbs that regular yeast wouldn't. So it's just going to continually develop and develop and develop and just get drier and drier. So it should age... Is that something that, yeah. that yeah. one should do? Is to or buy it definitely this for the can. Future? It yeah. can, yeah. It has and the option to. You know, I love the the older one was definitely drier. And Megan noted that the the new one's got more sugar, um, but it still tasted super clean and bright and fresh. It's nice to know that that you know, hopefully you could ideally you what you would do this. You'd have a couple of vintages and you taste and you get to see, is this a label? Is 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 South Hill Pack Bass something that I would want to buy every year? And, and lay down and then drink at three or four years, we're going to have to have a track record because yeah. we wouldn't know. <laughs> um, you know his, his blend might change. I know one thing about, about South Hill and Steve. He also he started a second label. I think it's called Gramophone, oh. which is, or he had two years ago, which is not his locally foraged apples because he's only had a certain amount of apples. So yeah. the South Hill brand, it, it should be what we're drinking. It should be slightly age worthy it should be from heirloom apple trees so to me that's just like premium label and i think this other label he started i think it's called gramophone is where he's where he's buying apples so that's something that maybe he can make more more volume of and those are interesting things um it's great to taste this stuff there's, there's so many things you can do i'm going to talk more a little more on this show because i'm so excited about this but there's so many things that you can do when you're smart like these guys at beer table and you <laughs> actually care about this stuff and do this kind of tasting because um gavin i mean you, you we were talking you guys could do this in your shop i mean you, you could do this as a party you could have side by side um tastings do you do you do anything usually like this or this is something that you guys do as a staff tasting uh we do have tastings uh open to the public every uh monday from five to seven but nothing quite this ambitious um, I think this is something that we would uh, typically do with the staff uh, often uh, on 
Fridays we'll have Funky Fridays and uh, we'll open some of the newer farmhouse and Britannomyces fermented uh, items. Sometimes people will bring stuff from their own vintage stashes. Uh, and uh, it's been really educational just to, to see how things uh, develop. Uh, and we are in no way, you know, in possession of great sellers in our small New York apartments. You know, we're kind of at the whims of our landlord's climate control. So uh, we see some uh, interesting things going on with uh, these beers that are, you know, made with the possibility for aging. Justin, we talked about a, cu- a couple of old, older beer bars in New York that, that do have good sellers. D- can you, any that you want to mention? Adobe Blues in Staten Island. For real, huh? Uh, yeah, I just saw Gail's Prize from 2005 on their list. Uh, a couple of other interesting oldies. Um, I did not inquire if they were actually available, but you know, <laughs> I was uh, I was excited to see that that exists. It's an unusual restaurant. Yeah, they've been there for a while. I think the, I, the manager I saw your Ryan good beer seal on the on the mirror. Yeah, he had a good beer seal yeah. a while ago. Um, also, I know in the, in the city, Mugs Ale House, yep. he's got he's he's got a pretty good seller or has Close had one. Now. They're closing at the end of this week. Is he? It's their last week. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I should go there and see what's left, left in the <laughs> cellar. And Sam uh, Barbieri from Waterfront Ale House, he also these these all these like old school guys went back to the early nineties. That that they used to collect more stuff. You know, they would yeah. buy multiple vintages. I think you and I went to a waterfront one time and ordered some. I can't remember what we ordered, but something old that was way off. You yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I think I do. Ooh. But you don't. Like, you don't really know what you're going to get. You no, just don't know. But I think yeah. that's what's fun about it. You know, it's like we're so used to all this like fresh stuff, and we're looking for any kind of mark of age to do the reverse of it and actually be seeking it out and seeking change and development is kind of cool to switch things up yeah yeah so what is this this has got like (laughs) a basil nose so this is mckellar and lindemann's spontan basil from 2015 and i'm not going to say why it was still in the cellar i mean some of these beers at the time (laughs) you know they were a little weird well this is also a 750 you know at one time i was buying cases of 750s you know interesting belgian beers in particular and like th- that whole case would sell over a year, and that was a pretty decent bottle list. But I, di- I did feel that you know four or five years ago the, the large format bottles stopped selling, and maybe that's why I'm wondering because at one point when I when I used to get McKellar, you know, there's trends in sales. I would get McKellar, and no matter what it was, it would sell in a couple months. So the fact that this 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 sat there for a year and didn't sell, it's probably more for, more about the format, isn't it? Or is it just the trendiness of McKellar, or is it just an oddball beer? I mean, it might be all of the above. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> this is also, I mean, you know, this is a lambic-based beer, or something that can stand to age and change, and I think it's something that people do age. So, it's a win know, for us. Thank you for not uh, selling it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for for selecting it. I have to say, it's better than it was. I think I remember having it when it. Yeah. Again, another beer that's done better with. Uh, this is only like three years of age. So, Jimmy, when you had it, was it? I mean, obviously on the nose, it's super, like super herbal, but. On the palate, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming now. When you had it originally, was it like just way too much? Or? Um, I don't remember, but I, I think that it's definitely more balanced. Nice. Yeah, it's almost like um, a lambic gruit or something. It's mm-hmm. like it's all about the mm-hmm. like that you know greenhouse of uh, of aromas uh, right at the at first whiff, and then it's really well balanced and just nice, easy acidity. Yeah, that would be fun food beer. Oh yeah, pizza beer. Maybe. So, for the uninitiated, uh, what's the deal with what? What happens to the beer as it ages? That kind of changes it, it, it into a, a more mellow flavor, and um, I would I would like to know a little bit more about that. Who wants to talk? I mean, Doctor Megan. <laughs> a couple of different things can happen depending on what kind of beer it is and what kind of fun yeasty bacteria things are in there um i mean if you're thinking more like these big sugar beers like barley wines and old ales i think the type of age that we're talking about more there um is just a general mellowing and i mean let's just say like smoothing out of flavors a lot of which is due to oxidation not necessarily critters (laughs) (laughs) uh but with a lot of these things like the 
uh, this spot in basil. It's a mouthful. Uh, you know, the change that you're seeing there is less from the exposure to oxygen and, you know, the effects that can have on the beer and more just uh, yeast that doesn't act fast. Brewer's yeast acts super fast and it makes all of the changes it's going to make and eats through all the sugar that it's going to eat pretty quickly. I mean, like on a relative basis. Uh, but like Britannomyces, that's a yeast that can continue to act for an extended period of time. It doesn't even start acting on the sugars that are that it can eat until, you know, pretty much the brewer's yeast is done snacking on its food. So it'll just continue to act and, you know, eat the sugar so it'll dry out a little bit. Uh, but it'll also create different flavors or it has the possibility to. Um, so a lot of times with these beers, you'll just notice that they get drier, they get a little <laughs> sharper, they can develop more carbonation, lose carbonation. I mean, the sky's kind of the limit, which is what's cool about this is that you know, we know have we have like a general idea of what could happen, but there's a thousand different variables that could affect it, which is why this is so cool. Because I mean, it was like totally mi a mystery, like what could have happened in that basement in that period of time. No, it's cool. Uh, let's just take a short break because we have to do a little mention. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes here on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca. Located in New York's Finger Lakes region, Ithaca boasts an authentic craft beverage experience, tasty farm-to-table culinary adventures, and scenic outdoor recreation. As the saying goes, Ithaca is gorgeous. The city is home to 150 waterfalls and gorges sprinkled through its downtown and sloping hillsides. State parks and acres of natural lands offer outdoor recreation for every level of enthusiast. Come stroll among the cool ravines, scenic hiking trails, and natural vistas. Ithaca is home to Ivy League Cornell University and Ithaca College, resulting in an influx of new cultures, new tastes, and new energy every year. There's so much to explore, from art galleries and museums to unique attractions like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Ithaca sits at the heart of a blossoming heritage and craft cider industry. Some of these delicious ciders can be bought in market, but many of the most unique varieties can only be experienced with a visit to Ithaca and this great cider region. Go to visitithaca.com to get inspired and plan your trip today. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey, this is our Lost Bottles episode. We've got the beer table crew of experts pulled out some uh, cellared bottles of uh, really good beers and cider from the Jimmy's Number 43 space. Um, this is pretty cool, and I, I want to give a big shout out. You know, one great thing about um, owning a craft beer bar for many years is that you get to know and trust your, your salespeople. And a big shout out to uh, B.R. Roya at um, Shelton Brothers and uh, the guys at B United who have pretty much consistently kept kept me up to date with you know the the better bottlings of things and and I feel like I was lucky that I got to know um, what I would generally stick with certain brewers and um, know know their beers um, so I don't really take too much credit for myself but you know the staff and that's how I met Justin Justin you were working at be United so you have a pretty good background on this stuff too I mean wh what are some breweries that you would instantly pick and think of cellaring um, from your experience. Well, we're about to dig into one of them, um, which is definitely <laughs> one of the, the more unusual breweries that, you know, I honestly don't know if they're, what, what they're up to today, if they're still brewing or not. Um, should have looked into that, but... Uh, I was just thinking, I don't think I've ever had this beer fresh. Yeah, I mean, I've only ever had, like, super old vintages. Uh, he's, uh, Jean-Louis Diet is a, he's a school teacher. He brews one day a month, or at least that's the way it used to be. Uh, it's a steam-powered brewery, um, which is why it's called Brasse à Vapour. Um, and it's, uh, to be kind, not the most sanitary environment. It's you know it's 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 wild and open and leather belts pulling things and you know it's it's very very old school. Um, <clears throat> so the beers are hyper inconsistent, but because of that, also sometimes, you know, really interesting and, and fun surprises. Um, so this is a uh, what two thousand three Brasserie Yeah, oh three uh, saison pupe, um, and it 
Was I would say it, it smells like pipe. <laughs> but, and, and this is one of the beers that we bought already aged. So yeah. if it's 2003, I probably bought it in maybe 2015, um, maybe a year before that. Um, and as you were opening the bottle, Gavin, just, just talk us through it because it was very exciting for me. You opened it and there was a cork. <clears throat> And the cork yeah. looked, it didn't look dry. It looked no, we definitely had a little bit of seepage through the cork, which makes you a little nervous. Um, and the cork, w- or the uh, cap over the cork was uh, 45% rust. Real rusty. It took some effort to get it off. Um, it may have come that way. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing. Who knows? got it, it was 10 or 12 years old already. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and there's a risk that it's either going to be a gusher and just explode all over the place, or that's going to be totally still, and both have happened in the past, but... We pulled that cork out, and we heard a little, like, whoosh of air. Um, still carbonated, if only faintly. And there's a little head on it, too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, are you surprised by that, Megan? I mean, it's from 2003. I, I'm pretty surprised by that, to be honest. I, I'm also equally surprised that it didn't just explode everywhere, because I've had that happen <laughs> too many times yeah. with their so, bottles. So with this bear, Justin, I mean, knowing Be United, since it was sold to me retail and probably when it was 11, maybe 12 years old, where was it from 2003? Was it at the brewery or was it at the distributor? Most, most likely it was in Connecticut for most of that time. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it probably wasn't released new. I, you know, I, don't, I don't think there's any particular rhyme or reason or uh, uh, tradition that he has with when or how he releases. Um, very inconsistent, as I said. So, but so you're saying just cool be that. united with, with their vi- – they do have vintage – Oh, for sure. Program, and, the and they have really good actually mature things, and yeah. So, they, so stuff will get sent. He'll import it to Connecticut yep. and age it there yep, before he distributes. Sure. Mm-hmm. So that's one one of the few people that's doing that with beers. Yeah, this is pretty great. What do you guys think of it? I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, I, I'll tell you honestly, Delicious. the last time I had it, I didn't like it as much. Another beer, I didn't like it as much as now. Um, it maybe because it was in. We had more of a. We had like a battle of the Belgians, more of a beer tasting setting. Um, but on its own, it's it's. I think it's drinking good. I think the last time I had it uh, was maybe a 2013, so, you know, I probably had it a year and a half ago. Um, it was totally still, um, equal parts oxidized and kind of watery and, uh, like, too acidic. It it wasn't the best version of this I'd ever had, but this is, you know, t- tiny touches of almost like baseball mitt leather, uh, lemon peel, um, great little acidity. Beautiful texture left over from that carb, uh, the CO2. It's it's done really well. But there could be a lot of bottle variation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone recently, um, we're all together for beer table holiday get together. And I think we opened, was it, was it 05? The Gales Prize? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we opened two, two different bottles. And one was just amazing, totally delicious. And one was not terrible but wasn't quite as great and a little bit weirder um so yeah and even you know in the same case of beer you'll have great variation over age was the one that you had in 2013 was that uh was it bottled improperly or was that just the way it came out i'm not really sure i i I think it could just be uh you know due to you know what they didn't plan on getting into the bottle (laughs) getting into the bottle uh this time around uh and that time it was Bottled too clean and just, you know, the the yeast that they used got through everything and kind of died. Mm. And this time there are some, you know, bonus critters from a less than savory environment that uh, gave this bottle its personality. I've, de- I've definitely had some screw-ups, too, with, with beers that I've matured that I've, you know, basically due to mishandling and moving into a place that I didn't have a cool place to store. <clears throat> and we've seen big flaws because of me mishandling beer. So we try to do better now. <laughs> and then th- this brewery again, Brasserie Vapour. I mean, it, uh, what's his bottling system like? Is he doing hand oh, it's, bottling? It's all, yeah, it's hand bottling. Yeah, so you yeah, never no, know. It, it's a it's you a washed shed. one, didn't? Yeah, I mean, this is it's truly one of the historical classics. I mean, it's like a it, it if it's not officially, it needs to be a museum. It's a really cool. Place. I, what I'd like to do is we, we're not going to be on the show that much longer, but it would be fun to taste it in an hour and see. Yeah, for sure. If it holds, that's one thing I remember from vintage wine: was how how it holds up once you open it. Um, and another thing to point out is just the care that you guys take with things. I, I really, th- I keep calling you guys the beer table experts, but I mean it. And I feel like because you guys got these out of my cellar and you cared for them and you wiped them clean, I feel like they're all going to be showing uh, their best. D- did you use some 
you know, intuition or science to pick these bottles because we haven't picked a, bo- a bad one yet. I think it was mostly gut instinct, right? Just grab what looks good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Noah and I spent a couple days um, with a lot of, you know, rubbing alcohol solution, spray bottles, toothbrushes, rubber gloves, and just getting these things all into the best condition that they could be in and then came up with a rating system for you know what you know definitely had cork rot what was just unsellable because we didn't know what the hell it was or what actually seemed to you know weather the age really nicely um and we brought a little bit of everything except for the cork rotted guys um uh just based on what would be like a fun you know progressive tasting great so let's keep going what's next it looks like we've got, let me double check the year on this, some um, Schneider Aventinus. Uh, we've got, oh, uh, what year do we have here? Just old. Just old. Um, that can't be that 14. old because that's 14. got the new label on it. Yeah. 14. Is, is there a date on it? Yeah, 14. There is. So I probably got it in 2015. And then we have a fresh bottle to compare it to. We can't call it fresh. <laughs> I, I bought it at a, at, a, at a deli in Bay Ridge that I recently, that I discovered that the other stuff I bought was already a year old. So we have, a, we have mixed samples here. Fre- fresher. It's more fresh. Yeah. Well, I'll give you like one of my great, I, I, I guess we can call it vintage beer if it's a year old. Out about 10 years ago, um, Brooklyn Brewery, Garrett Oliver used to make a uh, collaboration beer with, with Schneider. I don't know if it was called Hopf Schneider or Schneider. The Hopfenweiss. Mm-hmm. The Hopfenweiss. Yeah. And uh, we got a one sixth of that had been, been in Brooklyn Brewery, I think, or it might have been at B United. And it was a one year old sixth. And that beer was amazing. And I, I'm a fan of a lot. I think a lot of good beers benefit from one or two years um, of sitting, but it, it, cellaring. But it just doesn't seem like it's possible. Like, how can we. How come the, the, everything we're tasting is benefited from from being lost in this in this cold cellar? But but what can we do to encourage this more? Because it's it's not really there's not really a system for this. It's hard that nobody wants to store beer. We need to slow our rolls, Jimmy. That's what we need to do. We need to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what Gavin was saying earlier that you know every time we take in a case of something that we think is worthwhile, you know, more folks should be like try experimenting a little bit and. Don't just worry about the dollars and pull pull aside a few bottles and, and set them away so you can learn something in years to come. I think in addition to that, uh, it's good to recognize what you have um, and look for signs of something that might be good to age. I mean, like if you're getting, you know, if you're waiting in line for the you know can release of other half, yeah, drink that fresh. Sure, go for it. But you know, if you're buying something that's fermented with Britannomyces or just spontaneously fermented, or something with uh, you know a great big sugar content or something that's you know, extremely uh, strong and robust uh, or, you know, crazy bitter in the case of a couple uh, American barley wines, those can, you know, benefit from age or they sometimes are designed to need age to make them palatable. Uh, We recently tried a a six-year-old barley (coughs) wine. I can't remember the name of the brewery. It was a um, a gift from an employee of ours. And it was still extremely bitter because uh, it was, you know, hopped to death to preserve it for eight to ten years. Um, so just recognizing what's available out there to age is uh, something that I think uh, is it has been lost in the last ten years of, uh, you know, fresh beer taking over. What about this beer? I mean, I, I can taste so many things in it. Um, I get this. Well, I mean, compared to regular Aventinas, which I've not had in a moment, um, but uh, right off the bat for me, it's seemingly much more mellow and with a a much more mild spice content to it, Um, to the point that I think you could almost call this one deceptive. Like, it doesn't taste up to the strength that I know it is. So do you think that it didn't get better with age? No, not necessarily that. I think I just think it has changed. And I think that this I, is one that we have aged before previously. Yeah, I mean, in this case, I would argue that this bottle for me is definitely not better than the Young Fresh. This is, this is like dead. I love Young Fresh Aventinas, yeah. And it's, it's, like so, bready it's just and, so bright and spicy and, and just rich in character and so much texture that the, the old one, I don't think it has, in this particular bottle's instance, gained anything. I think it's lost texture. It's lost aroma. Um, but I've had experience with other old Aventinas bottles that have been great, so... 
yeah. you know, we win and lose. Do you want to t- taste the one that you guys bought recently? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's great. Um, yeah, it's a, and, it's a wild difference. It's been a little while since I've had fresh Aventinas, and it's, you know, you know, cloves and uh, brown sugar, touch of tobacco. It's really a beautiful beer, but the... <laughs> I don't want to say that the old one was bad, but it kind of reminded me of like a Mexican hot chocolate that got gold. <laughs> well, that's it. It, it. To me, it was like it felt more flat and and the the malty, like a flat malty drink. But yeah, the the fresh one is amazing. I have my Aventina story. I got to tell you guys this. Uh, Two thousand and one October, just after nine eleven, I had an old bar restaurant East Village. It was called Patio Bar Muggsy's Chow Chow Restaurant. And we had a, a cool German woman who did live painting. So she went up on the side of the building with a harness and kind of gorilla painted an unused uh, billboard. And people gathered around, and it was our Oktoberfest party. And what was the beer that I drank? Aventinas. And I drank eight of them. And I got a, <laughs> it's a strong beer. And I was definitely, I, I had kind of this great buzz for about three days. So, <laughs> to me, yes, the strong, fresh Aventinas is something I highly recommend for celebration. So that, 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 that cursed my image of Oktoberfest is that why would you make a light, kind of ambush beer when you could drink Aventinas for Oktoberfest? That's celebration beer to me. Who has a good story like that about Aventinas? I bet you do, Justin. Oh, man. Not, nothing quite that dramatic, but that's a great one. It was no, mostly about the German artist, side? the German artist who had a harness and yeah. scaff, you know, rappelled down onto this billboard and did a live painting while we all drank Aventinas. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I miss the old New York. Too, world was Jimmy. different after <laughs> after nine eleven, and also after nine eleven, since we're going back in time for like about definitely for about six months afterwards, the city was very different and. There were different types of alerts. Orange alerts meant that people were afraid to come in the city, so all your reservations canceled, but you had a really great diehard group of people that um, you know bonded together. So cheers to you guys. That's my Aventina story. I love it. <laughs> and uh, I love it. So what's next? I'll do another side-by-side, because these are a lot of fun. We've got an ancient, ancient, old-labeled dogfish head 60-minute here. I think it's from uh, 2005. Let's see. Is it on the neck? So I'll just d- disclaimer. I think that this dogfish head was there as a sample, or it, I don't think it's something that I ever bought. Hmm. Um, That's great. So I wouldn't. Well, have, is, I wouldn't have bought that. Is it safe to say that we can all assume that this is not going to have aged well? <laughs> we're gonna no, find it's out. Not we, we, we not safe. We should not assume things like that. We should let's, not assume let's, that. Let's, no. That's this is part of what I love about. Like, finding <laughs> but you, you also don't here. know, right? You, you could be surprised. The yeah, same so way that I thought the in Vegas. I thought being bad. I thought the Aventinas at five years would be would be great. Continuous hopping, maybe preserve this beer. I'm so ready to be surprised. Should we do old or new for us? Old. Old. I received a gift from one of our first employees of the Brooklyn location that uh, she had had a house party at one point and left a case of uh, like Corona Light and like all sorts of just wonderful beer uh, in in her backyard for like a year outside in Brooklyn and uh, thought it would be a nice gift for I think our first anniversary party and and brought that by and we cracked all that open and that, that included some old six point bottles too. Um, and some interesting homebrew, and it, it was actually pretty fun to taste through some uh, some delicious old old outside matured Corona, <laughs> among other things. So I'm an advocate of things of of tasting beer, even if you assume it's going to be horrible. I mean, I, I know with wine, it's like you never know what vintage is going to do well, and and you know. There's certain collectible wines. There's such expertise and, and <laughs> you know knowledge about it that, that usually what experts predict that this vintage is going to be age worthy and this one isn't. Um, but this one isn't. <laughs> Everyone's making the most horrible faces right now. <laughs> Wasn't that a good intro? I set you guys up. I love that. Yeah. For like a, this briefest split second, I forgot that what was in my glass, and I picked it up and got just a a nose full of. Cardboard and poison. So this is like a 14-year-old single IPA. Single IPA. Is this the first? This is the first IPA we've tried, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Can is is it such that uh, IPAs might not age as well as uh, the? Our the general recommendation ones? is that you not age them. But the line between barley wine and a 120-minute continuously hopped IPA is very fine. So yeah. 
But yeah. I think that would be more American barley wine and less English barley wine. Which and I would, I would just say, say that this limit. is probably – I'm trying to give myself some credit. This is probably a random bottle that they found. They really dug through. This seller had – at one point had 500 different beers by number in, in it. So there was a, could have been a lot of beers there. And if we had had that beer, it would have moved. So I don't think any IPA ever lasted more than a month in, in our cellar. Yeah, We're not blaming you, Jimmy. Definitely <laughs> something <laughs> that we saw, and it wasn't, oh, this is going to be amazing because it's so old. It was, we know we can get this beer fresh, and we want to see how it moved in 10 years. Yeah. But, that, but again, they, to give you a sense of stuff, IPAs do move, and um, I also didn't really buy much of it in bottle. Like I, I, Something that I, I've tried to focus more on draft because we knew that it was going to move, and then these other more unusual beers that were stronger, we'd buy in bottle. And at one point, that was the strategy. I don't know if, if that's still a strategy. What, what is it like now, you know, retail? I mean, are you guys, is that the same case? Things that, that people drink more of and fresher you put on draft, and then you might hold on to some more interesting bottles? It's still the same strategy, well, right? Well, I mean, I think for us it's a little bit different, just being in our location and giving our clientele I think people are less prone to get draft beer to take onto the train as they are bottles and cans. When we first opened, people were very hesitant to get cans, and now we're, what, 90% cans, 80% cans. 88.72. Yeah. That was, that, that was what the as six of, was. As of today, yeah. As that of was, today. What about Memorial Day weekend? Yeah. Um, uh, it, a little less than that, actually, because I think there were a lot of people bringing um, large format bottles and growlers to barbecues, so that will dilute the can sales a little bit. You guys must have some. We're actually doing July twenty third a consumer date of beer sales show with with some industry analysts. <laughs> um, I'm in. Yeah, you should come to that guy. <laughs> so you're in. But uh, so this is the sixty minute IPA. It's good, you know. Yeah, it is good. Uh, I I didn't actually hate the old one as much as you guys did. <laughs> Um, I like that it's actually it was actually like a really chilled out version of the of the exact same thing. I mean, it shows a lot of flaws, but um, I liked its mellowness. <laughs> I, I will put up for me. Ultimately, I'm going to give a plug for really good retailers. Same way we care about the importer and the strip. The whole supply chain is really important. You know, I, I remember having guys come up and say, "Hey, man, look!" I remember back when Hetty Topper was the thing four years ago. I was like, oh, I got a Hetty Topper. I'm like, well, how many like car trunks had it been in by the time you got <laughs> yeah. it and brought it to me you know i want to know that wow i go to beer table because i know that they first their their suppliers are on top of it and it's a cold chain right what, what else do you guys want to tell me about picking your suppliers and and the importance of it because then i know when i go to beer table the beer is going to be in top quality and these guys are looking at it inspecting the bottles dusting it off for me <laughs> you know i think um a lot of the since I started doing the purchasing, a lot of the brands that we carry come from you know self-distributed brands, uh, which is always really nice to do because you're interacting with the people that are you know making it, you know selling it and delivering it. It's all the same family, um, and it's cool to see where those brands, when they're you know grow to a certain size, you know what distributors they decide to go to and why. Uh, is it for you know great representation? Is it for great you know supply chain management and you know refrigerated warehouse to re- refrigerated trucks? Is it, you know, because they get more control over their own brand. So a lot of different decision-making goes into picking a distributor. Um, but I think in terms of picking brands to sell, um, Little Blind is a new brand that we just started carrying. And, you know, how excited he was for his brewery to be out there, uh, how much care he took in, you know, walking Noah and me through a tasting, uh, explaining, you know, kind of speaking to our level about, you know why he chose the you know bacteria strain he chose to sour his beers like everything about it was you know very you know passionate so we were able to say with you know a one ounce taste this guy's going to do great things and we're happy to sell his beer if i could jump in for a minute you guys are also incredibly diligent about receiving and ordering so i think that that <laughs> plays a huge part in it I know that I was not always the best at that when I was doing the ordering, but I mean, like, meticulously checking every case to make sure that there's no mixed cases of different dates, bottling dates or canning dates, Um, you know, really staying on top of the inventory list to know what is new to that list versus what you know has been sitting on that list for a long time. And sometimes that can be a good thing. If if a single case of JW Lee's has been on the list for, like, three weeks, there's a chance it might actually exist, and there's a chance that we definitely want it at the store, you know? Or singing blonde. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, cheers to you guys. Again, a, a toast to your professionalism, the importance of good retailers um, and all swaths. And um, it's still, I prefer going to a good restaurant, bar, bottle shop to, to get my drinks. And um, you guys are stellar. Uh, I think we have time for Taste This Last Beer. Um, and tell us about it, Gavin, because we actually have a great show on next, uh, Tech Bites. Uh, so with, this with is, oh, man. 2009. 2009 uh, Christmas Ale from Goose Island. Uh, before the big brand days, um, I couldn't find very much information because I believe they stopped making Christmas ale shortly after. Um, but it's super caramelly, it's a little cinnamon. It's Christmas. <laughs> I, I can't believe you found this. It's something that I remember. Yeah, before uh, Goose Island got bought by AB, we were getting some of their their bigger beers, and I remember we they had a, a barley wine called uh, Lord Henry or something. Right. Yeah, and I remember we had a couple bottles of that too. So it's it's great to see what what brewers can do. I mean, Greg Haw. I'm going to just say that I've met him and I like him, and um, I think that he made some pretty good beers. And uh, Greg, you're missed in the <laughs> craft beer community, dude. So um, anything you want to say about this beer, Megan? Before uh, we wrap I it would up? have assumed it would be much spicier and have still a bit more body to it, but it's actually really flattened out over time. Um, which I guess with, you know, 10 years of age, there's a great chance that that could happen. My guess is if there was maybe a bit more sugar content to it, or if maybe it was, I think that I saw you just pull off a cap. Maybe if it was cork and cage, it might've developed a little bit differently. Um, but still interesting to check out. I mean, when was the last time you saw that label? You know, it's mostly held up. And we're going we're gonna to take some photos. Everybody's here going to take photos and we'll be posting on Instagram. Cause this is pretty cool. I also feel like this is something that we could probably do about three more shows of, um, oh, definitely. Jimmy, do we have time for one more? Let's do one more because, really cool again, we're going to close out because uh, Tech Bites is coming on. Yeah, yeah, no, no. We love Tech Bites. <laughs> um, this is, wait, Gavin, do you have your phone? Oh, I remember yeah, what second. year this is. Oh, old. This is a, a collaboration between DeMolin and um, uh, Ron Pattinson. Right? From 2011, yep. It's 2011. Did a historical recipe, 1914 London Triple Stout. I um, thought this would be a really cool one to check out because we know you love Ron Pattinson. Oh, yeah. If you don't know him, what, what's his blog? Shut uh, the fuck up about BarkleyPerkins.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he came. We were lucky we had him when uh, Pretty Things was, was at its prime. Uh, Ron Pattinson came over a couple times to the States. We, we've done a couple shows with Ron Pattinson, if you Google it. Um, but we do love it. So, yeah, we got some pretty things. We actually had a stash of – I'll give a shout-out. We had a stash of pretty things when pretty things closed. I think it was the fall of 2015. I know we bought the last two cases of a couple of their beers from their distributor. And I still might have some of that, too. So we've got, we'll have got. we do another show like this. This was really great. So let's just taste this beer again. Um, if it's Ron Pattinson, it's a historical recipe. Anyone want to talk about that? Any background on it? I know nothing about this beer, but if I was to guess based on when he's talking about the recipe would be based on or would have originated in the style is that there might be a touch of Britannomyces in here that would have naturally occurred in some London porters and things of that ilk. And generally from following him, we know that before World War I and there was a grain shortage because a lot of grain in Britain was imported, probably the grain bill was higher, so there was probably more malt to begin with, right? Yeah. And yeah. Higher sugar content, so... A lot of tasting, good stuff. I would now say there's probably no Britannomyces in that. That is just like straight chocolate it's cake. It's almost like chocolate cola, yeah. Yeah. Wow. But this was yeah. a really special show, guys. I hate to cut it short. That's okay. I will tell you this, that this is something we can keep doing because yeah. this you, has Jimmy. been really Thanks, fun. Uh, last comments by everybody? Um, the, the thrill of going into a dank, dirty, closed restaurant basement and find some good beers. Yeah, I'll say, uh, after spending a couple hours in that basement digging through these beers, uh, when we got here to Roberta's today, I did ask for a larger size dump bucket because I thought this was going to be a way riskier tasting than it turned out to be. This was great. You guys picked some wonderful ones. Yeah, guys, drink old beer. Mm-hmm. Justin? <laughs> no, thanks, Jimmy. It was it was a nice flashback for me to, to remember the old Jimmy's number 43 and to, and to uh, wish it well by doing this tasting thank you and it was it was great talking about it um definitely if some some of you guys there's a bunch of you that listen that have had beer bars for a number of years if you got old sellers i think that justin and beer table uh, might be the guys to call because there's not too many people really really interested in this subject i think more and more people will and i think as the more of the breweries that we know 
I think as they get more established, you know, like like Brooklyn Brewery for sure and Ghost Bottles and stuff. I think as breweries become more established, th- they could probably start s- some of these programs. Definitely. I think right now everybody's so focused on trying to pay their bills and, and turning out beers that sell. Um, but this is a great, great uh, inspiration for everybody. So thanks so much. And I appreciate it because I feel like the work I did was worth something. But again, so much of it was about the suppliers I had and, and sales reps um, that always got me the, the, the best best beers. So cheers to the guys in the industry and, and ladies. Um, gosh, we have to say goodbye, guys. So thanks to our producer, Justin Kennedy, assistant producer, Aaliyah Papes, engineer, uh, Matt Patterson. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host of Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time and here on Heritage Radio Network. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.